I first met Dr. Lynn Kitai in February 2004. I was introduced to her by an author who wrote the foreword in her best-selling book, The Phoenix Lights, A Skeptic's Discovery That We Are Not Alone. Dr. Lynn, who was formerly known in the media as Dr. X, spent many years compiling research on unexplained phenomenon after witnessing three mysterious orbs of light that appeared very close to her mountainside home in 1995. I met Lynn for lunch and she presented me with a notebook filled with numerous photos of anomalous light she witnessed and photographed. As I looked through her photos, I became more and more convinced that we had the makings of a good documentary, although at the time I wasn't really considering anything other than a 20-minute short film. After a series of emails over the next month or so, Lynn surprised me by quickly assembling dozens of witnesses and experts, and we decided to move forward with the project. Lynn and I basically produced this film out of our own pockets, and what started out as a short film evolved into a feature-length documentary. Production for the Phoenix Lights documentary began on May 12, 2004. We set up our first interview in a conference room at Arizona State University with Dr. Paul Cook and continued shooting every day for a solid week, including a trip to Tucson to interview Dr. Richard Powell, Dr. Gary Schwartz, and Lynn's son Dan, who also witnessed the mysterious orbs. Since this film was very low budget, our crew consisted of Dr. Lynn, who conducted all the interviews, my mother Nancy, who helped lug equipment and took all the production photos, and myself. I took care of all the driving, camera work, sound, and lighting. It was physically exhausting and time-consuming to move from one location to another, so Dr. Lynn arranged multiple interviews at each location. After a long week of shooting, we finished up the last round of interviews and shot Lynn's reenactments at her Paradise Valley home. After reviewing the dailies, Lynn and I decided there were some additional key interviews and B-roll coverage that we needed, so I flew back to Phoenix a month later for a two-day shoot. I set up my camera near Luke Air Force Base to capture shots of F-16s flying in formation. It was blazing hot, over 112 degrees, with no shade anywhere. On August 4th, I drove my family to Santa Barbara, California, to shoot an interview with Jim Nelotoso and Dr. Rand Molnar, an expert in image analysis. We shot the interview at Brooks Institute's Montecito campus. Rand was an instructor of mine when I attended Brooks in 1983. After a brief family vacation in Newport Beach, I returned home and started working on a 10-minute short that Lynn wanted to show at the Bay Area UFO Expo later that month. Lynn was a keynote speaker at the Expo, and I barely finished the short film in time for the event where the Phoenix Lights documentary made its first debut. It was the humble beginning for what was to become a feature-length documentary that overall took nearly four years to complete. I returned to Phoenix once again from October 15th to the 17th to shoot additional interviews, reenactments, and Phoenix backgrounds. Other interviews were shot at my home a year later, and Keith Ritchie, a news cameraman in Phoenix, shot additional B-roll and interviews as well, including Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who was added in December 2007, along with a 9-11 operator and a professional pilot. Lynn videotaped other orbs and formations in 2005 that were also added to the film. Overall, we shot about 25 hours of footage, all of which had to be captured digitally into the computer and organized. It's one of the most tedious tasks in an editing job and very time consuming. I have to emphasize that it was an enormous task for two people to tackle a project of this size. Normally when an editor edits a feature film, the scenes are all marked and ordered according to the storyline of the script. Documentaries are a real challenge to edit because you don't have a script to work from. You basically have a bunch of interviews that somehow have to be pieced together in a way that tells a story in a cohesive way. Add to that the difficulty of trying to explain a complicated event with many perspectives and put it all into layman's terms while maintaining authenticity and integrity. Another challenge we faced was obtaining or creating the enormous amount of inserts, coverage, photos, and animations that were needed. Collectively, I spent many months creating hundreds of simulations and effects that were needed to effectively demonstrate what happened on March 13th. Most of the simulations and effects were composites consisting of many elements that had to be pieced together and programmed with motion controls. It was a very tedious task, rendering each effect, checking, tweaking, re-rendering, and repeating this process over and over again. Then, of course, I had to add the numerous sound effects and create many musical pieces for the soundtrack. Our goal was to complete the film in time to submit it into the 2005 Phoenix Film Festival. 
The final deadline was December 31st, and it was a monumental task to try to finish the film on time. We worked tirelessly for months, but the film was still very raw-looking by the entry deadline. Our next goal was to complete the film in time for the March 13th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights event. Harkins Theaters graciously scheduled three special showings on Sunday, March 13th, 2005. With the date set and Lynn working hard to promote the world premiere, I was under tremendous pressure to finish the documentary in time. All too soon, the big day arrived. Terry Mansfield, the key witness we interviewed for the documentary, hosted a cast party at her home in Paradise Valley. It was a beautiful morning and everyone who attended had a relaxing time while engaging in some very stimulating conversation. After lunch, we headed off to Harkins Shea Fortin Theaters in Scottsdale. Lynn did a great job of promoting the film with the local press and media, and all three shows were completely sold out. Lynn and I hosted Q&As after each show, along with cast members who were invited to stand up front and answer questions from the audience. The documentary was still a diamond in the rough as far as Lynn and I were concerned. So after the premiere, we spent the better part of three years perfecting the film, adding additional interviews, special effects, archive footage, new sightings, and Symington's public confession that he saw the Phoenix Lights craft himself. The film has been an official selection in over a dozen festivals worldwide and received three nominations for Best Documentary Feature. The Phoenix Lights won two international awards, including Best Documentary Feature and Best Director, and has been screened at numerous events, including the X Conference in Washington, D.C., the International MUFON Symposium, and the Bay Area UFO Expo. In addition, the film has been screened at Warner Brothers Studios, the Famous Man's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, and the Crest Theater in Westwood. Currently, the film is being distributed by Vanguard Entertainment and is available at numerous outlets, including Blockbuster, Hollywood Video, Netflix, iTunes, and Pay-Per-View.